All right, hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. Today we're starting off the first of the deformation topics. It will be called the double integration method. Uh, this method is built on the elastic beam theory and it assumes that plane sections remain as planes as the beam continually deforms and also axial stresses and strains vary linearly along the depth of the beam. So if I have a beam uh, like the section shown below which has a neutral axis at the center, I can do is, uh, what I can do is to deform my beam such that it's concaving up. And so it looks kind of like that, and the neutral axis in the middle uh, looks kind of like that. So at any point, if I were to draw a perpendicular line to the section of the beam, this perpendicular line is the plane uh, is the plane section uh, that we referred to as earlier, and it continually remains as a plane. And secondly, axial stresses uh, will vary linearly. So if I were to draw strains and stresses, they would kind of look uh, like that, a linear line. And uh, in the bottom flange, they would have uh, some sort of uh, orientation and then the top one, they would go the other way. And so the next uh, component of the elastic beam theory is that the deflection of beams is kind of described as the arc of a circle. So you can think of this beam getting deflected upwards and it's getting deflected upwards like the arc of a circle, like I've shown here. And so if I'm thinking about deflections, which I can label as V, and uh, the horizontal translation of the coordinate X, this is the kind of configuration that I'm going to be dealing with. And the radius of this arc will be R. So here we call the V as the deflection. And dv dx, which is the change in v over uh, the span of the beam, is equal to theta. And as you may have already guessed, this is the slope. Next up, we can take another derivative, and that gives us another valuable piece of information. And uh, this will equal to 1 over r. And as it happens, this is equal to the moment divided by the elastic modulus divided by the moment of inertia. And this we call the curvature. So this is another important piece of information that we're going to be dealing with. And so... Uh, let's talk about the uh, process of the double integration method. So, as soon as I find the cursor, here it is. So, we're doing the uh, double integration approach. So uh, anytime we're dealing with uh, deformations through the double integration approach, uh, the first thing we want to look at is to uh, sort of find out what the moment or bending moment uh, diagram of the beam looks like and move on from there. So assuming I know what my uh, section properties are, that includes uh, the modulus, the elastic modulus, and the moment of inertia, and I also know all my bending moments, I can pretty much find out what my curvature is. Once I know what my curvature is, then I can integrate that, find my slopes, then I can integrate my slope and find my deflections. It's going to be a continuous process. It will be pretty much the most mathematical part of this course uh, with lots of derivatives and integrations, uh, but uh, hopefully it won't be too difficult. So uh, we have the curvature uh, as the first step. So we are 
referring to curvature as V double prime X and these primes are sort of uh, uh, taking uh, or, or resembling derivatives of X so this is the double derivative with reference to X so we have MX divided by EI and we call this curvature So if I were to integrate this, I would end up with the slope v prime x. So this is the first derivative of x. And we have theta x, theta being the slope. And this is really just looking at mx, ei, and uh, the integration over x. And we're going to end up with a constant of integration. This is slope. And if I were to integrate one more time, I would end up with deflections. So we have Vx, this time there is no prime, theta x, dx. And this we call deflection or deformation. Yeah, let's call it that, deformation. Deformation is a much more uh, inclusive term than deflection, so I like that better. And so... We have now ended up with a number of constants of integration, uh, which I uh, should include, plus C2. <clears throat> and so, to figure out what these constants of integration are, we have to look at the boundary conditions and continuity conditions, uh, which I'll refer to as, uh, we need... the BCs, these are the boundary conditions, and continuity conditions, CCs. That's an AND. All right, so let's get started with an example. Examples are the best way to understand this process, uh, and that's what we're going to do. Okay, so we have, we're doing an example. And so for our example, we have a simply supported beam with a triangular distributed load. So I have a simply supported beam with a pinned support and a roller support. And it has distributed loads. that are triangular in shape. And at the very top here, we have a magnitude of three kip per feet. And this length down here is 10 feet. And we are measuring X from the side here on the left. So that's our X. So if I were to describe this uh, load uh, as an equation, this distributed load as an equation, I could simply write it as W is equal to 0.3x minus 3. And so going from load to the shear force, so we're interested in shear, what we can do is to simply integrate this, um, uh, this load equation, and we'll have V... And by the way, this is capital V, so I don't want you to get to confuse this with the small v, which stands for deformation. This is capital V. So we have a W dx, and that gives us 0.15 x squared minus 3x plus c1. So here we have the first constant of integration. And then we look at moment, because moment is where... Uh, the uh, double integration process begins and we have moment is equal to integral v dx all right and that should give us 0 0.05 x cubed minus 1.5 x squared plus c1x 
plus C2. Here we are, and uh, I like to use the boundary condition of, uh, or the conditions of my shear force and moments to find these constants of integration, because that's really the first step. And if I'm looking at my um, simply supported beam, and I'm uh, drawing out my simply supported beam, like a free body diagram, which is really should always be the first step. I end up with a resultant force of 15 kips, and that's really uh, the 3 kips times 10 divided by 2, and all should get reactions of 10 kips on the left and 5 kips on the right, with uh, the centroid of my uh, resultant force happening at 2 thirds of the length. And so I would have V0 at position 0, the shear value is 10, 10 kips. And when I put 0 in my shear equation, I'll simply have C1 equal to 10. Now I can do the same thing with moment. And moments is easier because I know for a fact that at the locations of the supports, moments are 0. So I'll have, uh, when I put 0 in the moment equation, I'll have 0 is equal to C2. And so I've ended up with two equations describing the shear force and bending moment uh, forces, and uh, I'll list them down here. Okay, all right, now we're going to proceed and use these two equations to obtain some very valuable uh, pieces of information. So, uh, with the double integration method, the first of the two integrations is to find, uh, to use the curvature to find the rotation and the slope. So we have, we're interested in rotation. And what we do is we say theta x is equal to integral mx over ei. And ei is, um, in this case, is a constant. It's not dependent on uh, the variable x. And we can really pull that out of the integral. And that means having 1 over ei and having mx within the interval. Here it is. <coughs> <coughs> and once we integrate it, we'll get a value of 1 over ei multiplied by our variables and all these x's. And because we just integrated again, we're going to have a third constant of integration, uh, which we will refer to by C3. And lastly, we are interested in deflection. So deflection. And we will have Vx. This time, this is the small v, uh, which is the integral of theta x dx. And that'll get us 1 over ei.
Should have probably closed the brackets there. There we go, plus C4. Now we have a fourth constant of integration. And um, I guess the last step would be to apply the boundary conditions. This time the boundary conditions are for the slopes and for the deflections. So we're going to apply BC. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes we don't have boundary conditions. Uh, we have uh, continuity conditions, which are between two segments of uh, the same beam that may have different properties, but they retain the same kind of deformations and slopes. So we like to use boundary uh, continuity conditions. But in this example, we're only going to limit the things to boundary conditions. So. Um, we have two kinds of inf information. Uh, we know that the deformation at the right side of the beam is equal to zero. And we also know that the deformation at the left side of the beam is equal to zero. And we don't really know what the uh, slopes on the two sides of the beam look like. Uh, they are not fixed supports. So for a fact, we know that they're not equal to zero. Uh, they, could be, they could have any kind of value. Uh, but the slopes, um, but the deformations, we do know. So we're going to use the deformations instead. Um, when I use the first uh, piece of information, V10 is equal to 0, what I'll obtain is C3 is equal to minus 66.7 over EI. And when I use the second piece of information, that is V0 is equal to 0, what I'll get is C4 is equal to zero as well. So I've pretty much figured out all my uh, equations using the elastic beam theory and the double integration method. And what I'll have is uh, the slope equation equaling to Here it is. And lastly, I'll have Vx for my deformation. And that'll give me two. Okay, so really the summary of this method involves the following steps. We start off with some sort of loading I'm going to refer to by as QX. This is loading. From the loading step, we need to obtain the shear equation, so VX. From the shear, we need to obtain the moments. And from the moments, we need to identify the rotations. That's theta x. And from the rotations, we need to identify the deformations. OK, so this was the first of the deformation uh, lectures. The next one will involve the moment area theorem. A moment area theorem is less mathematical, but uh, <clears throat> it requires more steps to remember things. Um, but hopefully, uh, you can find that method more enjoyable. It's more pragmatic, and uh, we'll do many examples in that lecture as well. I'll see you next time.